Health Saran is proud to sponsor and present a new episode in the series on freedom from disease by Anand Bapat, acupuncturist, naturopath based in Pune. Please enjoy it, share it with others and provide feedback as well. Here is Anand Bapat. Today we are going to be talking about diet. And when we talk about diet, we are going to refer to the different things under diet. So we are going to talk about foods to eat. What are the healthy foods? What are the foods not recommended? And what are the reasons for avoiding foods? So when we look at diet, it basically includes anything that enters the stomach via the mouth. This means food which can be vegetarian or non-vegetarian. Anything that we drink which can be water, soft drinks, fizzy drinks, alcohol, tea, coffee, drugs, medication, etc. Vegetarian food can be plant-based or animal-based. Plant-based can be fresh or non-fresh. Amongst the non-fresh, we have a lots of cereals, nuts, grains, frozen foods or preserved foods. Among the fresh foods, we have fruits and vegetables direct from the farmer or the garden to the table. In animal-based foods, we have got a variety. They are milk, cheese, eggs, etc., which come from animal base. And then we go to the non-vegetarian food, which is basically animal-based with meat. So it could be fish, poultry, animals of different sorts, pork, beef, mutton, lamb, denis, venison. Uh, buffalo, kangaroo, camel, the whole works, including seafood. Now, when we look at diet in terms of plant-based, the plant-based can be fresh, either from the farm or from the freezer. Unfortunately, you will find a lot of us today get most of our vegetables from the freezer. And I'm not talking about freezer foods like frozen food that we buy in the shops as a packaged frozen fruit from freezer to freezer and then open it just before you cook. Unfortunately, a lot of the so-called farm fresh food that we buy from the vegetable shop, whether it's potatoes, onions, etc. or apples, they may have been picked up six months or a year ago, kept in cold storage and brought out to sit for sale. So in a way, they are really stale. Then we have the proper frozen category which we take home and we actually go straight from the freezer to the cook, cook pot. Then we of course have stale food which we don't know much about whether it's one day old, two day old or a lot, or lot older. And then we have with the modern communication and speed of transit and logistics getting better, we have the seasonal foods and we also have a lot of non-seasonal foods. So the northern hemisphere may consume a lot of southern hemisphere foods which are non-seasonal for them out of season and vice versa. So when we look at diet, the animal based can be either fresh meat. Now when we talk about fresh meat, they are, there are different types of slaughter. There is the halal or kosher which is mainly the Muslim and the Jewish system of slaughter. They believe that there should be some prayer and there should be some service before the slaughter and the distinct feature between their slaughter and the regular slaughter is they believe in slaughtering such that all the blood has to be drained out of the body before they die which can be a bit of a traumatic and uh, uh, not a good sight to see because when you slaughter the animal you bleed it dry and then you slaughter it then there is the other style which in India is called a jhatka, which is in one stroke you kill the animal. And in this case also there are some pluses and minuses in that situation. There is very little torture because the animal dies instantly. But then there is blood within the meat. So it has its own different taste and different benefits and different disadvantages, which we won't go into today. But just for your awareness, I'm pointing out that fresh meat can be halal, kosher or jatka. Now among slaughterhouses you got either the sudden slaughter where the animal comes in and they just knocked off or these days a lot of companies slaughter uh, avatars will tend to have stunning 
where they stun the animal and manage. Now in the halal kosher category where there is struggle and tortures death, where you are supposed to drain all the blood, but there is this possibility that because of the torture experience it can lead to a lot of stress hormones being released by the animal and that can stay in the blood, uh, stay in the meat. In jhatka because it is a clean death, so less stress on the animal, but there is blood in the animal, so we don't know about that. Now even animal based meat, we can either get it fresh or you get it frozen, which means it has been slaughtered a day, two days, a month before or whatever. Then you get the treated meats and then you get the cured meats which are preserved. Now when you talk of diet, you talk about the benefits of fresh food, benefits of frozen food, vegetarian plant based meats, vegetarian animal based milk and products, eggs etc. and non-vegetarian all meats, fish, poultry etc. It is said that every meal ideally should have texture, color, fragrance, solids and liquids, hard and soft, raw and cooked and a fair variety. And generally it is said that the plate should be well decorated and presented so that you feel like mouth watering and you feel the energy to look. It builds up an appetite and you feel like eating and enjoying your meal. You look forward to it. Now I have categorized foods in slightly different categories just to make a point. I categorize foods as first generation which means they are fresh from the garden, eaten raw, seasonal. Okay, now I'm sure there is a lot of argument about which generation what would be, but I've just roughly categorized it, so bear with me. Then there's the second generation foods which are fresh, but they are fresh two, three days old. They may be eaten raw, they may be lightly cooked first generation foods, cereals properly cooked, etc. They might be second generation. Third generation foods are stale or frozen recently lightly cooked meals. Fourth generation foods are frozen, cold storage, veggies and fruits, well cooked, overcooked, etc. Fifth generation are the ones where there are preservatives added, preserved foods, junk foods, poor nutritional foods. And there is a further category which I have noticed that has happened. Lastly, foods that do not attract animals or insects, which is nearly dead food and genetically modified foods may fall in that category. I can narrate a very interesting personal tale. I was touring on my motorbike across South India and I was hungry and I went to a Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet. I think it was Kentucky Fried. And I had something to eat and while I was sitting out to eat, I saw a bitch, a dog, which had just delivered. So it was still in the feeding stage and walking around my table looking for something to eat. So I thought I would do the right thing. I went out to the counter, got something chicken or something like that, that I thought the dog would cherish and would be nutritious. I bought the whole meal. I went to a corner of the land, opened it up and put it out there for the dog to eat. And the dog took one sniff of it and didn't even touch it and walked away. And I was amazed. And I went back to the counter and said, look, what's wrong? Why isn't the dog eating that? And after some time it dawned on me that maybe the meat is sort of packaged food or you know these days you have meat which is made up. It is not proper original meat or they have added enough preservatives or GM foods or whatever it might be. But it put off the animal and which is why I am putting this. And in Ayurveda there is a distinct saying, if animals don't come to food that means the foods have no nutritional value. So if you have insects crawling on food, flies and ants and other stuff coming to the food, that means it has got some value. Absorption. Now we can't just look at diet, we also have to look at the absorption value because we want to have energy out of that food that is helpful for the body. So what are we talking about absorption? We need food that has got good energetic value. Now the energetic value can only be obtained after full mastication for salivary digestion which we know about and we talked about earlier. We also talked about maintaining a strong stomach acid for good digestion. 
We also talked about liquefying the food for absorption, uh, progress to the duodenum and further absorption, rest for digestion, permit gentle movement for complete reabsorption and delivery of waste with regularity. So that is the absorption procedure. We talk about Dr. Khadar Wali. Khadar Wali is an eminent scientist who has been to the US who worked on uh, hormones and was shocked to find the effect of hormones on humans. He could not believe that in developed countries animals are treated with hormone hormones to give more milk, to give better meat quality, to grow faster and then you got the genetically modified foods which are also going to affect the body. And he has found that there are lots and lots of side effects of milk and milk products coming from such animals, non-veg food which is linked to animals treated with medications and steroids etc etc which actually lead to steroidal uh, dysfunction in humans and thus they wonder why they are getting disease when they're supposed to be eating nutritious beautiful burgers and chicken etc etc so he has now come up with food which is not genetically modified which is natural to the earth and which was in ancient times the staple diet of most people and he has gone on to propagate millets as a major uh, grain to be eaten and he is fondly known as the millet man of Bharat or millet man of India and he strongly advises don't eat non-veg food don't drink milk milk is meant for the calf and even the calf cannot have enough milk because these days cows produce instead of a couple of liters they produce 8 and 10 and 12 liters so that's too much for the calf as well he has also noticed that wheat and genetically modified foods and insecticides and pesticides that are used on foods have got their own problems so he recommends millets as a staple diet i strongly recommend you should follow kadarwali and go and visit his milletplanet.org to get more information reasons for avoiding food now why should you avoid certain foods if the food is overcooked or if it is unseasonal food you're not going to get much out of it there's very little nutrition left for some people if they eat raw foods and they are unable to digest it it is pointless to have those foods you should avoid that non-veg food definitely avoid it because if they have got hormones that are used as part of their growth uh, cycle they are not really ideally suitable for the human gut and the hormones cause their own problems. All genetically modified foods are not ideal for us. Reduce rice and wheat mainly because they have got genetically modified components and they might have their own problems. Stale foods which are more than 24 hours old should not be consumed. Reheating foods, it's traditionally mentioned in Ayurveda that you should not reheat foods. If you cook something in the morning, then that's it. When you have it in the evening again, whatever is left over, you have it cold. You do not reheat the food because that's not good practice. Poorly grown foods with poor hygiene. Now we hear about vegetables being grown in sewage area, watered with sewage water. We really don't know how infective that is or whether the plants have the ability to extract only the good component of water and a good wash to the vegetables will keep it clean. Again, it's sensible advice to say do not consume such foods because you may be prone to bacterial infections or other infections which may come off the vegetables. Milk and milk products. Now, a lot of people have said milk is not necessarily a good diet for humans. We only need milk when we are babies and after that we don't need milk. And there has been enough work done to say milk is not really digestible properly by our gut. But that is just my take on it. Again on top of it if there are hormones in milk because of increased milk production due to hormonal treatments then that's definitely a no no. So what is the ideal diet to enhance our body? Preferably one should be vegetarian. It should be a first generation food. Fruits and vegetables fresh or frozen. Try to include millets in your diet. 
Now the millets in your diet are jowar, bajra, rajgira, ragi, nachani, corn, varai rice, etc. These are the common millets available in India. But you can look up millets in your area and see what's available. Seasonal items, so eat only seasonal fruits and vegetables. They should be lightly cooked. Use less oil and definitely use some pure ghee because ghee is good for you. Now some importance of the food system, we have repeated that earlier in our previous videos. I'll repeat it again because we sincerely believe we do not follow the rules, especially the first two, three rules. Chew every mouthful 40 times. I beg to say very few people do so. They'll just have a mouthful, chew it two, three times and swallow. We do not make food into a paste and mix it with saliva. We just have a couple of pieces and we swallow it. Remember the mouth is the first step of physical and chemical digestion of food and swallowing should be totally natural. A lot of times the taste of food can change from sweet or spicy to a bit neutral before swallowing if it is well mixed with saliva. We also say chew your drink and drink your food. So when you eat your food, you should chew it enough that it forms a liquidy paste. And when you drink your drink, you should chew the drink so that it mixes with the saliva and then goes down the gut, the throat. Preferably having a good digestion with no drinks during meals. And I'm not talking about alcohol, I'm talking about even liquid diet. So you should not have water before or during meals, maybe about an hour after meals. Eat only two or three times a day, not too many times, not too many snacks. Ensure bowels move every day and have clear urine at least once a day. So now we are at the health benefit time, knowing, doing and being. And what are the things that have been covered now? We talked about diet, we talked about weight, we talked about non-weight, we talked about fresh and frozen food, we talked about the benefits of genetically modified and hormone related and insecticide, pesticide related food and what things you should avoid to try to get the best out of your food. Seasonal foods is another area. So having known all that, now I would like you all to put it into practice. So if you can go and practice for the next three months regarding eating vegetarian diet, uh, seasonal foods, keeping off milk, keeping off meat and fish, keeping off sort of uh, genetically modified or hormone treated foods, going on a millet diet. And then after it becomes a habit, and if in the meantime, over the three months, you see change in your health, you feel better and you're better off and you're lively and you're energetic and life is going wonderful. Then because over three months, things become habit forming, you might find that it is a better habit now and you're used to it and you don't need to worry about anything anymore. You just happen to do it by yourself. You don't have a glass of water with your meals. You don't go out and buy unseasonal foods. You don't eat non-veg. You might have a bit of fish. You don't have too much of frozen food. You try to eat fresh as best as possible and have it lightly cooked with light oil rather than overcooking stuff. And once that becomes a habit, you'll find you'll be on the path to a better health and hoping you'll become freer from disease. And if in that process you have improved your health, you improved your immunity, you might find if you're suffering from anything that the suffering starts to ease and life becomes better in quality and enjoyable. So let me bid you goodbye on this note and I'll see you again next week. I'll just introduce myself a little bit regarding the work I do. I'm based in Pune. We have Bharti Acupuncture Bhavan, where we treat people with acupuncture and natural therapies. I teach Surya Namaskar through the Scientific Surya Namaskar Academy, where it takes us eight hours over eight weeks to teach people Surya Namaskar. And we have 70 levels of difficulty. We are attempting to bring scientific basis to natural therapies. And I being an expert on Shivambu practice, I would like to propagate it a lot across the world. We've been offering a free internet clinic for the last three, four, five years, and people have been benefiting from it. Hopefully they're getting the results because people keep coming back and people keep asking questions and come back with comments to say they're happy. So I take it that's good. Freedom from disease is an educational program that we offer in Pune to corporates and to large crowds and groups where we are 
passing across the same philosophy that we are now putting on video in a series of about 20 to 24 videos for your benefit across the globe where you can take full benefit of the knowledge, put it into practice, benefit and try to become free from disease. Thank you very much. Have a great day and I'll see you next week. Bye bye. Thank you Anand Bapat for your valuable information on health. This series is a 15 to 22 part series on developing oneself into a healthy person. This series will educate, guide and provide support through our online educational and support services to enhance your health. All queries are welcome on the following email. Download app Health Siren for all health solutions at your doorstep.